Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for this sacred place that we can be together. Lord, we thank you for this Catalyst band and the way that they have led us to give honor to you today. We thank you for Tina and Jorge who are giving honor to you by offering their time and their talent uh, in these coming days to serve you. God, we thank you for this church. And we thank you most of all for you and the mercy and the grace and the peace that you give to our lives that we can actually say in the middle of all the chaos of the world that it is well because you are well. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome. That's fun for me to say welcome to you. Uh, great to be back. Great to see you all. Uh, it's always sort of a little disorienting for me when I come back uh, to this place, which is so familiar, and, and knowing uh, all of you. Uh, such a different world than the one that I've been uh, living in, and it's great to be with you. Uh, if you're able to come to that reception today at 1230, I actually brought back a bunch of copies of the Justice Thread from Ghana uh, that I have uh, for free for you guys there if you want to if you want to get one copy of those and, and do that, uh, that study on biblical justice. Uh, I want to say thank you so much to you who gave a gift from the heart and funded that. I just can't tell you what a difference that made for us in a way that that supported us uh, in, in our work. It was, it was really huge. So thank you for coming through on that in such a big way. So God bless you for that. Uh, well, John, Pastor John uh, invited me to preach uh, and, he, and he told me the topic. He said, hey, I got this great topic for you. It made me think of you. I want you to preach on the fear of failure. And he goes, I bet you know a lot about that. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute. There's so many ways to interpret that. Like when you think of me, you think of fear or you think of me, you think of failure or like what? what? He goes, oh, no, no, you know, <laughs> because, you know, you guys did something that I bet you were afraid you were going to fail. And that's true. <laughs> you know, there was quite a lot of fear for us when we closed up our life in Ghana and put up all of our stuff in storage or distributed it to various people and just took our three, what? Close in What did I say? Oh my gosh, thank you. My wife is here to help me make sense. Uh, thank you, Joy. When I closed our life in Davis and moved to Ghana, yes, that makes more sense. Uh, uh, that was a, a scary time for us. And taking our three kids and our dog and our big pile of bins to a place we'd never even seen before, a lot of fear. Uh, and a lot of fear of danger, a lot of fear of uh, that we might, this whole enterprise that we're doing might completely flop. And so that is something that, that we have been wrestling with, is, is how do we then overcome uh, that fear? And I prepared this sermon like, about overcoming fear. And then uh, as I was um, uh, about to like, put the PowerPoint together, I got the, 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 the branding of the series, and I see that it's called Fearless. And that kind of threw me because in my plan, my first thing I was going to do is make fun of the word fearless. Uh, and I don't know how to make the adjustment at this point. So I'm sorry to the wonderful people that made this great branding. I know what you mean by this. Uh, sorry. Okay. So I wonder how many of you have seen the movie Inside Out? Let's show this uh, slide. Okay. A number of you, if you haven't seen this movie, you got to see it. It is brilliant. The, it's a story of a, a girl named Riley, a little girl named Riley. Her family's moving, and she's having all these kind of emotions about this change that's happening in the life of her family. And most of the movie is happening inside her head uh, with these main characters, which represent kind of the core emotions within her. This is the control panel, and you can see various emotions at work uh, controlling her behavior. And so it's, it's happening with this like what's happening inside of her. It's really interesting. So here's, here's what's happening, uh, the, the different five main emotions inside of her. There's, there's anger, right? It sometimes has fire going off the top of his head and like it gets angry at things. Disgust, joy, fear, and sadness. And there's, over the course of the interaction, you see there's actually kind of a role for each of them in their lives. Now, uh, when I think of the word uh, fearless, I think of it's, it's kind of like you, you flick this guy out of the puzzle and then you lose that voice of fear in your life. And I wonder, what is that like? What is it like if you actually don't have the voice of fear? Let me show you what I think fearless looks like. This is fearless. <laughs> okay. That is fearless. A man sticking his head inside a crocodile's mouth to get a good picture of a molar. Okay. Uh, I have a few more pictures to share with you of what fearless looks like. Let's roll that.
Wow. Fearless. Hooray. More like stupid. Any other adjectives? What else? What else do you want to throw out uh, about some of the pictures you just saw? Anybody? Reckless. I call them knuckleheads. Okay, that's my definition of being a knucklehead. But it's also fearless. Like, those people don't have enough fear in their lives. Uh, the, the, the voice of fear, their control panel <laughs> is not there. Now, one of the reasons why I think uh, that we, 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 we think they're such knuckleheads is, is uh, the potential payoff of the risk they took. Okay, they're taking profound risks to their lives. And like, what's the potential prize that they get? You know, if they, in, in one case, the guy's going to get a really good picture of a, of a, of a crocodile's tooth. Another one, like the guys who are standing on the outside of that little window, if they survive that, the prize is they get to clean a window, <laughs> right? Is it, is it worth the risk of their lives? And so we have this voice of fear within us that I think God gave us, and it's the voice, the impulse of self-protection. We notice things that are dangerous, and the voice of fear inside of us shouts, whoa, look out, look out, that's dangerous. And sometimes we actually should listen to our fears and say, huh, I could die, not worth the risk. No, thank you. Am I right? Fear has actually an important uh, role in our lives. When we went to Ghana, a lot of people thought, oh, this is crazy. What are you doing? You know, you know, but we felt like, okay, we're taking, you know, there's, there's some risk involved. We're taking a sort of a calculated risk. And, and we listened to people giving us you know, expert advice on security. You know, we were concerned about, okay, what are, the, what are the risks of malaria? How can we take appropriate prevention of that? Risks of, uh, you know, security for the home. And they gave us advice about how to kind of secure that with burglar bars and electric fencing, just things that were standard in our area that we needed to have. And when we moved in the first day, uh, we didn't yet have the electric little fence and burglar bars up yet. It was going to be finished the next day. So we're going to have one night without the required security measures. And as we're moving in, a friend of ours talked about an armed robbery in their home that happened in that same neighborhood a while back. We're like, oh. So I felt afraid. And I didn't sleep that night. The whole night, I'm like <laughs> looking out the window, right? But sometimes uh, the voice of fear, you know, just leads us to certain, you know, sensible precautions of, of how to kind of organize your life. Um, but there is... Uh, other sides. We, I don't think we necessarily want to be without any fear. But there's another side of the spectrum, and that is when fear is alone at the control. And we call that cowardice. We have a picture of that here we can show. When fear is the only voice in our lives, when fear is alone at the control panel with nothing to moderate it. And some of us live our lives like that or we have periods of time in which the loudest, the strongest, maybe the only voice in our lives is the impulse of self-protection. And we, we, we do a lot of extreme things to protect ourselves. We make all kinds of choices about where we're going to live, who we're going to talk to, who we're going to befriend, um, what activities we're going to do. We make choices for our, our, our children based upon it. Fears of actually often a very, very strong voice in our lives when it becomes the only voice, and we would never risk anything, uh, we would never listen to any voice louder than the voice of our own self-insulation, protection. Well, that becomes cowardice. And the Bible has some strong words about that. I'm going to share one that I think will be a bit surprising for us from Revelation chapter 21. Now, when we go to this verse, uh, this chapter, we, we preach on it a lot. We think about it a lot because it has such encouraging things about the end of the world, the coming of the fullness of the kingdom of God, and Jesus wiping every tear from our eyes. We talk about that a lot, but there's, there's another section where we, we don't ever look at. I just want to draw our attention to that. Uh, chapter 21, verse 6. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will enter, inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, 
They will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Go to that next slide, please. So this is interesting. There's this point in time in which all the things that are mixed up get separated, and there's this sort of this, this judgment, this, this moment coming in which it's revealed, you know, those who, who really did receive Christ and, and, and orient their lives into a life of discipleship versus there's, there's behaviors which, are, which we see are, are outside of, of, of what real discipleship looks like. And then there's consequences uh, for that. And we're going to see that in all of these examples, there's examples in the Bible of actually people who are redeemed from those behaviors and forgiven. So we know there's, there's mercy available to us. But it's interesting to me that in a list of things like murder, immorality, lying, uh, witchcraft, these are, these are things that we would all say, yeah, yeah, as Christians, we believe those are sins. Those don't reflect. I mean, you can't really call yourself a Christian and go around murdering people, can you? Right? But how fascinating that the first thing on this list, cowardly. Would you have anticipated that word being on that list? It's interesting, right? As it's talking about the things which are outside of Christian discipleship, something that's totally outside the purview of Christian discipleship, cowardice is on that list. That's not who Jesus made us to be. Jesus didn't live that life. His disciples didn't live that life. And as we become Christians, we also let go, not just of these kind of name brand sins that we're kind of familiar with, but we also begin to let go of our cowardice and become something different than that. Peter experienced a moment of cowardice. I I don't need to read. I think you just studied it just uh, maybe last week. This moment of Jesus uh, is on trial for his life before the religious leaders. And Peter uh, says that he's going to die with Jesus. I'm going to die with you, Lord. And then a a servant girl recognizes him and says, hey, weren't you with Jesus? And he says, no, 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 no. I don't even know the man. Calls down curses. I don't even know the man. And he betrays out of fear. He betrays his Lord and, and just to save his own skin. Peter has this moment of cowardice, which is a great shame to him that takes him a while to recover from. But let me ask you this question. Are our only choices uh, in our lives between being like a fearless, risk-taking knucklehead and being a a totally fear-obeying coward, are those our only two options in life? No, there's a third way to live something called courage, something called courage. Can you show this? I want to give you just an image in my mind that really has spoken to me about that word courage. Uh, this is, how many people saw this on the news last May? Okay, you know what, you know the story. This is Mamudu Gassama. He is an immigrant from Mali, a West Africa, kind of near Ghana where we live, a West African migrant to Europe. He made the hard journey through the desert of Burkina Faso, up through Niger, up into Libya, where he got stuck for a year and suffered beatings and then found his way to, to, to get over the water of the Mediterranean into Italy. And I mean, he, this is like your classic undocumented migrant story that we see on the news all the time, African immigrants coming up. Uh, into Europe, and somehow he was able to get papers to temporarily stay in Italy, and then he, he went up to see his brother in France, and he has all the incentive in the world to keep his head down and not draw any attention to himself. But he's walking along, and he sees a four-year-old boy in Paris hanging off of a balcony. This boy's father had left him unattended in the house while he went out and run errands. Then the, the boy's father decided that after he was done with his errands, he thought it might be fun to go play Pokemon Go in the town while his boy was at home. Everyone say, grrr. That's the angry voice in us. And, uh, and it, it feels to me a lot like the Good Samaritan story because there's a lot of, you know, good French citizens walking along that are like, you know, <laughs> I almost said, sacre bleu. <laughs> <laughs> They, 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 they see this and, and, and they're like, whoa, no. And, and a lot of people, what they responded is, is to pull out their cell phones and, and film what's happening. But this 
this, uh, this Malian immigrant uh, ran towards the danger, uh, scaled the balconies. Let's, let's watch this video. And we have a rescue in Paris. An immigrant from Mali is being called a real life Spider Man after he rescued a child dangling from a balcony. Look at this. You can see Mamudu Gassama, that's his name, scaling four floors, pulling himself up from balcony to balcony until he makes it to the four year old and pulls him to safety from midair. I'll just give you a moment to get to that point. Now, CNN affiliate BFM TV reports that French President Emmanuel Macron has invited him to the Elysee Palace on Monday to thank him personally. Listen to how Gassama explains his feat. We came here to watch the football match at a restaurant. I saw a lot of people yelling, cars were honking. I got out and I saw the child who was about to fall from the balcony. I like children, so I will hate to see him get hurt in front of me. I ran and I thought of ways to save him and thank God I scaled the front of the building to that balcony. How did you climb? It seemed easy. I got on top of a door and I managed to pull myself up from balcony to balcony and thank God I saved him. Wow. That's insp inspiring. Now, I just a few minutes ago, I showed you videos of people taking risks and we called them knuckleheads. And this man took incredible risks to his life and we call him a hero. What is the difference? Wait, what is it? He's saving the life of a child. They asked him, why did he do it? He goes, I like children. Very simple. Right? Why, did, why did you climb that balcony? Oh, well, well, I like children. And I would hate to see one be harmed in front of me. So I risked my life to save them. Right? Just simple, simple calculation. You know, he, he likes his own life, but he also likes children. And so he's going to like take on this incredible risk. He could have died. Uh, he could have drawn attention to himself and, and had legal trouble. All kinds of things could have happened. But he, he, he threw his life on the line and saved a child. The difference between these like risky, daredevil, silly things that we scoff at and this hero is why did they take on the risk? He took on risk for love of a child, which we see as valuable. And other people taking on risk for thrill or adventure, which we think is not worth it that level of risk. There's competing voices within us. And sometimes we need to listen to a voice stronger than our fear. The apostle Peter makes that transition. The apostle Peter is able to, to come out of this shameful cowardice that he had at the crucifixion of Jesus. And in Acts 4, we see a very different Peter. Let's go to Acts chapter 4. Now, remember that he was cowardly uh, outside the trial in front of just a, a servant girl confronted him and, and, he, and he denied Jesus. Now he's in front of the powers that be. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees, these are the powers and, and, and the uh, sort of soldiers, military, like police kind of thing, uh, came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And so they seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. This is serious. But many who heard the message believed, and so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the others of the high priest family. We got the big shots here. They had Peter and John brought before them and to question them, by what power or name did you do this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked, how was he healed? Then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, 
whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. The stone you built is rejected has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And when they saw the courage of Peter, and when they saw the courage of Peter and John, and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note, these men had been with Jesus. Wow. Very different Peter, isn't it? This is a courageous Peter, and he keeps talking about the name of Jesus, which he had kept denying. And then the name of Jesus is by the power of Jesus. I'm associated with Jesus. He comes up and he takes a stand. Why does he take a stand? Well, see, by virtue of taking the stand, we see that 5,000 people are saved. We see that uh, a witness is given to the the powers and to the people. Uh, We see that there's fruit there. But how did it happen? How did someone whose, whose courage melted away suddenly become this courageous, bold person? The one thing that they noticed most about him is courage. What changed? What moved Peter from cowardice (laughs) into courage? What moved Peter from cowardice into courage? Well, the first thing is what we looked at last week on Easter Sunday, the, 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 the mercy, right? The mercy that comes to Peter, he failed big time. And maybe some of us can relate to, to, to that, to having failed big time. And he experienced the mercy of God In his failure, he was loved anyway. I think for many of us, if you're if you're sort of paralyzed by a fear, specifically a fear of failure, like you have to be awesome in anything you do, you won't try anything if you might possibly not be amazing. Well, maybe the thing you need most in your life is some more failure because you get over it. Right? I I remember when I was like in junior high, and I got and, and and this most scariest thing when you're a junior high boy is is to, to ask a girl to dance at a school dance. So you have this like telephone game with like, you know, a hundred friends that pass the, the thing over there. And I remember the first time that uh, I did that and, 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 and I thought my life is going to end if I get rejected. And then, and then you get back and I got rejected and I thought my life is over. I can never recover from this humiliation. Like it's over. But then you know what happened? I didn't die. And we have that experience in life when you, if you, if, you, if you fail and then people love you anyway, it's like, oh my God, I'm still alive. Maybe you need more failure in life. I'll pray for you uh, for that. Okay. But Jesus will love you in the failure. And Jesus loved Peter and that was powerful. The second one is power and risk. Uh, the Pentecost story happened in between these two events. The Pentecost story, the, the power of the Holy Spirit showed up and it filled the disciples and that made, them, that made them bold. That actually just happened two chapters earlier. The, the, the Pentecost story, power uh, in the moment of risk. And it says again in this story that in that moment when they say, by what power did you do this? And he's like on trial in front of the powers. It says, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, then spoke boldly. Now, I think in my life experience, when I experience the Holy Spirit in me the most, is that moment when I step out in faith, right? When I'm leaving, living just a very safe, comfortable life with no risk, my, my faith actually feels boring and dry. Has anybody ever felt like your faith is boring and dry? Anybody, anybody felt like, where is God in my life? Yeah, yeah I've had tons of that experience. I, I don't feel like that when I'm in danger. I'm like, oh, God, save me. You know, God is going to be, God, I need you. You know, like you don't, that's the antidote actually is to step out in, in, in faith. And, 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 and what we see time and time again in Peter's life is when he does that, he sees the power of God. Like imagine that moment where Jesus says, yeah, come step out of the boat and walk on water. You know, he, 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 he did that, right? Now he had a couple of things. One, one is he, he, he had a couple of steps where he walked on water. He saw the power of God. Now, then he failed, right? But then Jesus caught him. And so when he tells that story to his friends, does does he say, oh, this one time I took a big risk in my life. I stepped out of the boat. I got all cold and wet. I'm humiliated. I'll never never risk anything again. 
I learned my lesson. But where does he tell the story? Yeah, I failed, but Jesus caught me anyway. Or does he tell it? I walked on water for like three steps. It's amazing, right? We see the power of God in risk. When, when he, Jesus sends out the, 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 the 72, two by two, they come back rejoicing at what Jesus had done. Some of us need more risk in our life. So go, 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 go step out in, in faith and then watch the power of God hold us and deliver us and come through. I think this is basically my, my, my central you know, testimony is that every time the last couple of years, I, I, I was constantly in situations that felt like totally out of control, like way beyond my capacity to understand even what's happening around me. And I'm just like, ah, you know, and every time I felt God come through and do amazing things. You know, I, if you come, I'll tell you more stories about those uh, at the reception. But it's incredible what you see God coming through. There's also uh, this third one, which I think is a, is a very significant point for us today, which is uh, discovering a love stronger than fear. Last week, uh, John looked with you at the reinstatement of Peter, and the love of Christ coming to Peter, even in his failure. That's, that's kind of this point here. I want to look back at that same scripture and look at the other love, which is Peter's love. So if you can turn with me to that next scripture, John chapter 21. When they had finished eating, Jesus says to Simon Peter, remember Peter has had this horrible failure of cowardice. When they'd finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. What's the question that he's asking there? In this part of the scriptures, he's saying, do you know that I love you? It's not this question. He said, do you love me more than something else? This is that competitive values within us. What voice are you going to listen to? And he's reminding Peter of what Peter loves. Just like Mahmudu said, well, I like children, so I'd be willing to sacrifice myself to save one. He's saying, do you love me? Feed my lambs. He's reminding him of his love for God and his love for people. And those two loves are going to keep growing inside of people. His love for Jesus and his love for people are going to grow stronger and stronger and stronger inside the life of a disciple until they are stronger than fear and can at times compel Peter to be brave. He later tells him about the kind of death he's going to die. Actually, you are going to suffer. You are not just a risk, it's a certainty that you will suffer. But will you do it anyway? I think that's a question that, that we all need to take seriously today. Is okay, we have a voice of self-protection, and self-insulation, and when we, when, we do, when we protect ourselves, we protect our reputations, we protect our comfort, uh, and those actually, you know, have an important role in our, in our lives. But sometimes are the things that we love enough that they will compel us to become a stronger voice, stronger motivator in our lives than the fear which holds us back. In Ghana, uh, one of my central things that I worked on, I mean, basically I, I was trying to answer one question the last year. I spent, I spent a couple years there, but most of what I did was trying to just focus on answering one question. Uh, when I would travel around Volta Lake, a place where there was over 10,000 children held in child trafficking in horrible conditions, and our major job was we were trying to figure out how to free them and end the practice of child trafficking, uh, all around that lake are churches. And I would meet with pastors that do their ministry in an environment in which there is child slavery, and they see it. And I, I remember the first time I had the same, basically the same conversation over and over and over again with many pastors. And it goes something like this. Pastor would say to me, hey, I know that there are child traffickers, people who have child slaves in my own church. And I've been thinking for a long time that I should do something about it. But the trafficker is the chair of my elder team. Uh, he's the biggest giver to the church's finances. Uh, he's got, you know, between 
you know, his immediate family, uh, the, the, you know, kind of the, the women and children associated with him, the traffic kids, the employees, you know, he, he's, kind of, he's basically, re- basically oversees a third of my church. Uh, and they'll, if I was to stand up to him, well, all those, a third of my church would leave. Uh, the finances would be ruined and I wouldn't be able to care for my family. And uh, maybe they would attack me. Maybe I would even be killed if I try to stand up to him. So I've said nothing. And the first time I, I, I had that conversation with the pastor, it was a real gut check for me because I'm like, oh my gosh, am, am I going to get somebody killed? in this work? What, what is the answer? You know, what, what, would I, what would I do? But I think that God had been preparing me for that moment because a lot of those risks that he was grappling with are the things that I'd been wrestling with. What would I, would I risk in order to help these kids? And I came to the thing that, you know, a lot of people would say, oh, no, no, of course not. You, that, that's too much risk. Of course you wouldn't. But actually, I, I actually believe that the Christian thing, the, the Jesus thing to do there is to stand up to the trafficker, to accept the risks. Yeah, you, you might split the church. Yeah, that, that could happen. Uh, yeah, you're going to lose a lot of money. And, 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 and how are you going to pay the bills? Yeah. And, and you might even experience physical harm, but the love of Christ compels you to do it anyway because there's... There's, a, there's an abused child in your church that if you say nothing, they think God doesn't care. And they need to see you fight for them. And so basically what the justice threat is, the whole project that we did and all the conferences that we did, it was just simply trying to give that pastor and the hundreds like him and the other leaders in that area that are, that are believers in Christ, the, the moral certainty that in fact this is wrong and the imperative that, in fact, Jesus wants you to stop it. I want to introduce you to someone I think is a hero. Uh, this is Preacher Rogerson. We call him Grandpa. Um, this is an inspiration to me. He is a pastor, a lakeside pastor in a village on the eastern shore of Lake Volta. And I have watched him be brave. I have watched him. Not only did he... Uh, he was at one of our conferences and we first got to know him that way. And then he just took, he just took it on and he just, he, just, he just went for it. And he preached in his own church at that lakeside place, preached fiery against child slavery and explained to people that justice is a God of justice. And then I watched him gather his whole village, people from other churches, people, his whole village and the, and the village next to him, all in this big place. And I watched him stand up, this, this little old man, like I watched him take on you know, hundreds of people and just tell them how it is and how, what needs to change. And, and they were pushing back on him and he just stood in there and stood his ground and spoke on behalf of those kids. And then as months go by, we just keep seeing this guy. We see his bravery, his courage in action. We, at one point, the only thing he ever asked of us is he asked, hey, you got any bad, I need, I need some new batteries for my megaphone. We're like, megaphone? What are you, what are you, what are you? What are, you using a megaphone? what are you using a megaphone for? He's like, oh, you know, and then we found out from some people that he had been on his own initiative, on his own dime, on his own risk. He had been riding around on his motorcycle up and down the coastline, like, like hours. Like he, he did like about a five-hour uh, coastline stretch of this, of this lake on his motorcycle, going to villages that, that we've never been to with his mega going, hey, everybody, everybody gather around. Listen, I got something to tell you about child trafficking and Jesus. You got to listen to this. We got to stop this. Turns out it's wrong. Turns out the, God cares about this. Turns out you guys, listen, the police are going to come for you. We're going to help them. You need to turn around. You need to give the kids. And he is preaching the, the, the freedom of these child slaves all up and down the coastline. And he's just like, Any, my batteries are dead. Any, ch- any chance I could get some more batteries so I could keep on preaching the word of God and rescuing kids? And we're like, we will get you batteries, okay? <laughs> Lifetime supply of batteries if you're going to be that brave. Uh, incredible, incredible act of, of courage. Now, I don't know. May- maybe in your life it's going to look a little different. Maybe it's not going to be scaling a balcony. Maybe it's not going to be preaching off a motorcycle through a megaphone. But I'm pretty sure that Jesus is going to call you to be brave. I'm pretty sure he has already been doing that. But we are going to make a lot of little choices in our lives. 
And, and the decisions we make, the little choices add up to habits, which add up to character. The little choices are going to determine who we are. Are we courageous or cowardly? Well, let's start being brave. In every choice in which you see that some, you could help something that you love, you, you could help you know, win a soul to the Lord, you, you could help uh, mend a broken heart, you could help you know, steer someone towards wisdom instead of folly, you could, you could uh, help lead a group of people into, into greater, greater health, you could, you could be a huge blessing in some way, you could contribute you know, with, with generosity and daring to some great cause, you could, you could give of your, your life and energy to something, but it will cost you and it'll be uncomfortable and scary, what are you going to choose? I recommend courage. Know that there is mercy and failure. There is the power of God and risk. And that you love something more than yourself. I'm going to close with this quote from our Spider-Man of Paris. He said the, uh, uh, the, the, the president of France interviewed him. He asked, you know, how did you uh, be the, you, no one else climbed. How, how were you brave enough to do this? And, and one of his answers was, well, when I started climbing, it gave me the courage to keep climbing. <laughs> and maybe that's the answer for us. If, if, if you have a desire in your heart to become a braver person, maybe the answer is just to start climbing. Just do one thing. Just get up on that first level and maybe God will supply the courage to climb up to the second balcony. Amen. Lord God, we pray that we would be a people of courage. Use us, Lord. Challenge us. Give us the strength to respond. And may we see the power of the Spirit in action as we jump out of the boat. In Jesus' name, amen.